we're going to move straight into um, a piece about making culture the core of your business success. And we're going to welcome um, the CEO of Bizat, offering smart insurance and HR through technology. Talal Baya, please come up on the stage. It's all yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about company culture. It's something that we spend a lot of time on at Bezat. I think it's very important for all of you as well, because once you start scaling your team, you're going to actually realize that every other challenge you face outside of managing human capital and hiring people pales in comparison to the human challenge. Next. Just to give you some context and background on Bezat and where we are today, um, you know, we started in 2014. We were four people at the time, and today we're 145 team members. We've probably hired around 180 people. We have three offices. 80% of the team is in Dubai, and 20% is split evenly between India and Turkey. Um, it's a pretty diverse team. 43% are female. 23% are below the age of 25, and we have 28 different nationalities. And really the goal is how do we take such a diverse team and build one company culture? So an investor, we're raising our Series B round, and an investor sent us a questionnaire recently, and one of the questions was, what keeps you up at night? And we had the entire executive team fill it out. It was, you know, open text field. We didn't speak to each other before doing so. And these were actually the responses, right? So Tarek, our chief commercial officer, what keeps him up at night is building or scaling our company culture. Brian, unifying and empowering the team around our company culture. Safa, our CTO, keeping the team motivated and aligned to our company culture. And Gregory, ensuring we're growing fast enough while maintaining our mission and culture. And myself, maintaining, improving, and evolving our culture. So I guess you get the message that we all spend a lot of time thinking about this. So why did we even start thinking about company culture to begin with? So Bezat Culture 1.0 is really uh, refers to our initial thoughts around company culture, how we built it, and why we built it, right? So in 2015, we raised a seed round of a million dollars um, anchored by Beko. I'm pretty sure I told them at the time that we'd be cash flow positive and doing 20 million revenue by now. So apologies for that. Um, but we started using the money to scale our team. And we immediately realized, probably two or three interviews into the process, we realized that we had no idea what we were doing and we didn't really have a strategy. Now, we all knew how to interview people, so we spent a lot of time researching how to ask questions, how to do reference checks, etc. But once we would actually um, group up together and discuss the candidates, we were talking about very different things when it came to their personality, which is what we referred to it at the time. Today, we refer to that as culture fit, right? And, you know, someone would say, yeah, you know, this candidate has all the skills, has the experience, and they're very nice. But nice is very relative, right? It's not even a meaningful way to evaluate someone. And there's companies that are full of assholes, right? but they're very successful companies because they own it and they align everyone to that and they're okay with the culture. So we realized that how do we know how to evaluate candidates and what to look for if we haven't actually defined it yet? And how do we know if these candidates are gonna fit in with our current team members? Because when you're you know, 10 people, it's very difficult to bring in someone who's gonna disrupt your, your company culture and disrupt the team, right? If you lose one person, that's 10% of your workforce. And we started doing research about company culture because we thought it was kind of a buzzword. You know, it's something that people want to talk about in Silicon Valley. Um, and we found a really great research paper, which all of you should read before you start hiring people, right? There's really three organizational blueprints to hiring a team and to building a team. So the first one is called the professional model, right? So you hire people based off specific skills, which is what most enterprise companies do, right? They look at specific experience and they try to acquire that experience. 
The second one is called the STAR model, right? So a lot of companies, maybe like McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, follow the STAR model. So finding by far the most talented person you can find who has the highest potential, the highest ceiling, and those are the people we bring onto the team. And the last one is the commitment model. And with the commitment model, it's all about culture fit. Obviously, they have to be competent, but you would never negotiate if you had any doubt about a candidate's culture fit. And the study actually looked at you know, thousands of companies, and one of the statistics they came up with is that for every million ideas for a high-tech business, only six ever IPO, right? And if you have a weak culture, your risk of failure is exponentially higher over 100% higher than if you had a strong culture. And if you follow the commitment blueprint in your early days, you have the lowest probability of failure com as compared to all the other blueprints, and you ha you're the most likely to IPO, or you have a higher likelihood of, of um, going public. So once we became convinced and we saw the data, because we're very numbers driven at Bezat, we decided that we need to set out and really define our culture so that we would have a framework that defines what we look for in each other and how we evaluate each other as well, right? Because that's also a second thing. How do, you, how do you evaluate someone? It's very subjective if you haven't built the right framework to do so. So we went to our team and we were around 11 people at the time and we really just asked them three questions. We said, what do you like the most about working at Bezat? What do you like the least? And how do we compare to your previous work experiences? Right? And these are the actual results. So what we found is that people really cared about accountability, honesty, customer focus, empowerment, excellence, and hard work. So we let our team members actually define our culture based off what they liked at Bezat. And we came up with culture 1.0, right? And we had five values and we had three codes. Very easy to remember, everyone was able to align around this. And when we were hiring people, we were having discussions about are they accountable, are they hungry, and do they have critical thinking skills. So it was very straightforward. But as with all things, it was good for a short period of time. Right? So just to recap at Culture 1.0 stage, what are the things that we did right? Um, there's obviously a lot of things we did long, wrong, so the list is you know, way too long. It's probably going to be 20 slides. But what we did right is we really focused on finding the right talent. Our 10th hire was an HR manager. Not just an HR manager, a head of HR. So we actually spent quite a lot of our budget on hiring the right person. And we really focused on how do we interview candidates. Um, it's not a you know, one, one hour thing where you like the person and that's that. Right? You need to be very data driven, you need to have the right process in place, and you need to define your culture. Now, a lot of cracks started evolving as we reached 100 people, right? Because culture 1.0 was good, but it was really only good for finding the right people and then aligning everyone so that we could all have uh, share feedback with each other, right? We faced really three issues at the time. So one is decision making had become much more distributed at 100 people, right? So it wasn't just myself and a handful of, of colleagues making decisions. There was a lot of decisions being made across the organization by a lot of different people. And then I also realized that I had actually no awareness as to if we were performing well at our culture, right? If you think about it, you know, if I'm the CEO of an organization, nobody's going to come in front of me and be a very poor example of our company culture. So I thought we were doing great, right? I was really happy. Everyone was you know, showing their hunger in front of me, really showing the highest critical thinking skills. It's not because people are you know, conniving or sneaky, right? But it's just society, right? You leave the best version of yourself to your manager and the worst to your friends, family, and colleagues, right? So I realized that I have no idea if we're doing well at our culture. And what I, what I believe we're doing is actually meaningless. So our culture needed to give people more context so that they can actually police themselves, right? And, and enforce it amongst themselves. And the last thing is we saw that there was very low levels of debate in the organization, right? So everyone was super friendly. We'd have these meetings where we'd be trying to solve a problem. And within the first five minutes, everyone would agree on the solution. Right? And we were becoming very homogeneous. Because we had focused on just five values and three codes, everyone was alike, which is probably not a good thing. So we basically set out to build Culture 2.0. And the focus there was to provide more context to people, 
five, you know, five values are very easy to remember. Everyone could recite them in the company, but unfortunately it's not enough context because the interpretation of those values can be very different when you're at 100 and 120 people. So even though it was something that became you know, harder to remember, it was very important for us to be able to allow people to really understand our culture and use our culture to make decisions. So not just hiring decisions, but decisions across the organization. And lastly and most importantly, the real goal of your culture is to make sure that the best and most disruptive ideas and decisions are the ones you're pursuing as an organization, right? And actually, you know, after we, we uh, launched our new culture and I was sharing this with one of my friends, they were in Jordan and I think there was some uh, panel with Jack Ma there and somebody asked him, he, sh he videotaped on his phone and he sent it to me and um, someone asked him, how do you guys make the best decisions, right? And he said, if we're sitting in a room and we make, and there's a decision to be made and everyone in the room agrees on that, we take it and we throw it in the garbage because that's just a mediocre idea. It's not a great one. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through all the principles, but just to give you some more context, I'll show you how we actually use them, right? So we have five principles today and there's four sub-principles under each principle and this will continue to grow as you know, the team evolves. But we have our customer principle, which is always be the closest to our customer. The execution principle, get shit done. The improvement principle, being the best is temporary, becoming better is permanent. The innovation principle, value debate over consensus. And the feedback principle, initiate necessary, radically truthful dialogue, right? So I'll give you an example of how we can use this in decision making and problem solving in our organization, right? So the customer principle is always be closest to our customer and we have these four sub-principles. So our product team was working on our payroll module, right? And they really were trying to understand what's the scope of this module and who's the competition for our payroll module, right? So is it Excel, is it banks, is it exchange houses, etc.? Well, our principle says always be the closest to our customer and understand the job to be done, right? So job to be done theory is something that I can't go into because it's a pretty extensive topic, but it's something that everyone in our company uses. And the way they actually use this to build our payroll modules, they realize that, you know, we could help a company automate all their monthly payroll calculation, right? And if we're going to define competition, competition is anyone who can get in between us and our customer in, a, in terms of the scope of the job to be done. So what that meant was companies could actually use our payroll solution, calculate everything, issue pay slips to their employees, let them submit expenses, but then they would have to actually go offline to their bank to issue the, tra the transaction. So in this scenario, the bank is actually a form of competition to us, right? Because our customer, we're not, you know, there's somebody coming in between our customer. So always be close to our customer means that for this job of running your payroll, nobody should come in between us. And that actually led them to increase the scope of the project to include actual payroll processing as part of our module, right? So we could have actually stopped where most payroll solutions stop, but because of our culture, they were able to take it one step further. I'm not gonna go into all of them. I mean, we could do that in the Q&A if anyone has questions, but there's one thing that we've learned, which is everything changes, right? So our culture cannot be static. Um, this is hopefully gonna take us another 12 to 18 months, and we're gonna have to come back and revise it. And what's very interesting about the study I was talking about earlier is if you look at the organizational blueprints, once a company goes public, the commitment blueprint is actually an indicator of the slowest growth, right? So a company that follows a star blueprint or a professional blueprint will grow much faster post IPO than one that follows the commitment blueprint. So you have to always evolve and you have to always change. And this is really our, our learnings, right? So the, when you think about building a culture, the holy grail is can people come to work and be themselves and still align to your culture, right? And that's something somebody actually told me, right? I said, you know, I sat down with somebody after the first month on the job. I said, what do you like here? And they said, I can really be myself, right? And they said, I've never had this experience in 15 years where I can come to work and be myself. And 
The second thing we learned is how you approach your company culture and how you align everyone to your culture is actually much more important than the underlying values of your culture, right? So um, it's not a one size fits all. You'll see different types of culture along across all the different organizations and companies and sectors. But the most important thing is, are you aligning people to your culture? And being self-aware and being brutally honest with yourself is probably the hardest thing to achieve when you think about company culture. Because it's very easy to think that you're doing well. Um, but as I said earlier, as you actually, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a founder, you have actually no idea if you're doing well with your culture. And what are, you know, what are the benefits? Why did we go through all this effort? And how do we know it was worth it? So we've hired around 178 people today over the last five years. Only nine people have ever left voluntarily. Right. And we think that's a pretty amazing metric. And the cost of replacing those nine people, we calculated at one time it was over $15,000 to replace those people. And this is not even including the opportunity cost, right? which is probably five times higher. So it's definitely something you need to do, you need to spend a lot of time on. And you know, keep in mind that today we're five executives, we're five you know, C-levels, and every single one of us stays up at night thinking about our culture. Thank you. And we have like three minutes for any questions that people want to ask Talal. He's been amazingly open. I also see that um, the Beko capital culture has evolved because I think when we started Boost Mena, Danny Farah would have put a little asterisk in that phrase, get shit done. So I have a question here. I told Talal I'm going to ask him this question. He answered it in the presentation, so he took it away from me. Um, but Talal, um, when, when entrepreneurs are in their early stages, they're, f they're firefighting, they're fundraising, they're executing, there's a lot of things that are at hand. They're hiring, they're building their teams, they're focusing on growth to, to get to that next milestone. And you decided to set aside some time and resources from you and your management team to really think and uh, to think about culture, and it's a, it seems like a very large and daunting task. So, what is the right amount of resources, hours per week, hours per month, that took you, that you think is the right time is the right amount of uh, resources dedicated to building culture? And then, what do you do to make sure that that's sustained and it, it's not just a presentation that's given to employees mm -hmm. and, and, and investors? Yeah, I mean, so the way we think about it is not how much time are we spending on it, is how is it part of everything we do, right? So we're actually spending 100% of our time on culture, right? So whether it's, you know, any of those things you mentioned, scaling, fundraising, hiring people, that's all to do with our culture. It's about how we think about it and how we align to it. So they're not mutually exclusive. It's part of what we're doing. Um, and what was the second part of your question? So how do you ensure that it's continued? I guess you answered the second, the, the second question. But so the, maybe the, the first question is, how do you launch culture? I mean, you've done, you've done a bit of research, but how do you actually sit down and put together a team? Did you put together a team? Did you say, well, we're going we're gonna to put together a, you know, a plan and then take it to the employees, and then this is how we're going to measure. This is how we're going to me measure that we're going according mm -hmm. to our cultural plan or culture manifesto, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah, absolutely. So when we were 10 people, we did the survey, what do you care about in the company? We came up with our values. And then every quarter, we would actually do a peer review for everyone. And the peer review was basically score them on the five values and the three codes. So it was just a lot of repetition until people got used to giving each other feedback and framing it around our culture. Is there another question? Microphone over here. Tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Lulu. Um, I was just wondering, what kind of leadership style do you have in your company? And why does it work? Yeah. Um, so actually, we have very different leadership styles across the company. Um, Pretty hands off, um, pretty reserved. So I'm not, you know, hey guys, let's let's do this and rallying everyone, um, and that works for me, right? And if I think about, you know, our chief commercial officer, he's the exact opposite, right? So he's very much gung ho and trying to motivate people and very loud. 
Um, so, it's, like I said, it's not one size fits all. You can have a very diverse team, very diverse personalities. Everyone can be themselves at work, but you can also align them around your culture. I've got a question over here. Hello? On the right? Hey. Hello? Hey. Um, so I'm, I'm totally agree with culture, but I'm going to play devil's advocate a bit. Um, for us, we're an early stage startup, and we took two months to hire the first employee, and he's an amazing culture fit, but there was an opportunity cost because we needed someone to execute, and it took us two months. So at an early stage, how do you think of that trade-off between just getting someone to execute, whether they're a culture fit or not, versus waiting to kind of get there? Yeah. How do you um, so, I mean, in our experience, you know, I guess to tell you about the metric, two months is pretty good. Um, you know, our conversion rate from first interview to hire is less than 1%. So, I'm not even talking about screening applicants, right? Um, but the, we've always sort of, we've always underestimated how, uh, uh, we've always underestimated a person's skills, like the balance between skills and culture, right? So we've all, you know, every single time we thought about either hiring someone or firing someone, we always over overestimated the impact of their contribution relative to the negative aspects if they're not a culture fit. Um, so there's no shortcuts, right? So if you can't find the person, it means you have to spend three times as long hiring can interviewing candidates, which is something we realized early on, and that's why it's very abnormal for a company at 10 employees to go hire an HR manager. Right? And then within probably eight months of her joining, we started hiring recruiters because it was just taking us way too much time to do the first level interviews. So there's, you know, it just takes time. Yeah, Talal, I have one more question. Sorry. Um, how do you think about work life balance? I was just reading Qualtrics. Uh, acquired for $8 billion and how the founder is really focused on work-life balance as a culture for his employees. He actually used to track the amount of time they spend in the office versus outside of the office with family and whatnot and starts optimizing. So as you're building your, your culture, you know, you had hard work out, out there. But what do you think about work-life balance and how have you, have you seen that impact product, productivity in your firm? Yeah, I mean, Back to what I said earlier, people need to be themselves, right? And for me, I mean, obviously, work-life balance is not something I think about, but some of our team members do. And it goes back to being, you know, to actually, we use one of our principles to think about work-life balance, right? So we had somebody who said, why do you guys, you know, why do you guys force people to come later to office? My manager said, hey, you're coming from 9 to 6 and you're leaving. And the reality is that's not an issue, right? So that's a symptom. So if your manager is coming to you and saying, why are you leaving at 6 p.m.? It's probably because they're not happy with the quality of work or you meeting deadlines. It's not about your work-life balance. There's something actually underlying there, right? So initiating necessary, radically truthful dialogue is very important so that you can actually get to the bottom solution. So we've never ever had any issues with somebody um, working too short of an hours. That's not something we measure, right? We're measuring output, and that's really a two-way thing, right? It's you setting your timelines, when you're gonna deliver things, and then being accountable for that. Is there one final question? So, I should type, so my name is Dasha from Cairo. Big believer in company culture. Um, just tying in actually to that very last point where my question was, uh, directed is, how do you measure the impact of your company culture quantitatively, not uh, qualitatively? Yeah. Um, so, you know, back to what I, uh, um, uh, I guess just before I answer that, just one more thing about uh, the point you have made is, it is part of our culture to work hard, right? And if that's not okay with you, that's completely fine, right? But we own it, right? We own it and everyone's aligned to it. And you know, to your point, how do we measure it quantitatively? Um, going back to the metric I said, which is you know, if we hire somebody, there's probably, I think, a 10% chance that they're gonna be a C player. There's a 50% chance they'll be a B player. And then there's a pretty high percent chance they'll be an A player, right? So when those A players leave us voluntarily, that's really where you can measure it quantitatively, right? And as I said in the beginning, you know, less than 10% of our hires have left voluntarily. 
and if we can calculate the cost of them leaving, that gives us actually a figure. And you know, those eight, those ten people, approximately ten people leaving, cost us well over two hundred fifty thousand dollars at least. If I don't even measure opportunity cost, right? So we have to thank Talal for being so open and sharing some really honest data points. <laughs>